Pokemon's roots as a Japanese role-playing game are really obvious, especially if you've played any classic JRPG series. I'm using JRPG to loosely describe Pokemon because it properly sets the expectation that the game follows some traditional JRPG conventions, or the expectation that you'll spend most of the time menuing and pressing A. This is similar to how two daywalkers who are not terminally online would loosely call the Super Smash Bros. series a fighting game because you pick a stage and a character, then beat each other up. The label is good enough to get on with the actual discussion. Back to the topic at hand, Pokemon deviates from traditional JRPGs to be as approachable as possible during normal gameplay. There are no game overs. Your party is very flexible. Healing is free. You can ignore nearly every mechanic, and while the ability to read is helpful, it's not even required. Yes, the games have generally gotten easier over the years, but Twitch Plays Pokemon has proved that thousands of chimpanzees mashing a controller could beat a Pokemon game. Given all this, I don't mind that Pokemon isn't aiming to be extremely difficult. The ease is what got myself and many others into the series before we could read. The world of Pokemon is super approachable because, both in-universe and in the real world, people are free to engage with Pokemon in any way they see fit. Almost every type of Pokemon fan matches with a trainer class if you think about it. You've got the casual trainers, the up-and-comers, the veterans, low elo know-it-alls, lore theorists, furries, shiny hunters, speedrunners, or this guy that makes wildly inappropriate copypastas about Rapidash and Vaporeon. The point is that there are a lot of ways to play, and a lot of different NPCs that expose you to other ways of playing. However, for those actually trying to complete the game, there's a class of trainers that you must best to be the very best, and those are the gym leaders. The gym leaders on the surface level are video game bosses. You usually have to beat one to progress in the story, and upon beating them, you'll usually gain access to items, events, and new areas. The level of their Pokémon tend to be the highest of anything you'll encounter before them, and they may serve as a preview of rare species you don't have access to yet. Since nearly every gym leader specializes in a single type, it also heavily encourages players to engage with the game's mechanics regarding type effectiveness. Gym leaders are experienced and accomplished trainers, and sometimes influential community members too. Gym leaders aren't meant to be difficult for the sake of being difficult. I believe gym leaders are mentors. They are meant to be a challenge, and by overcoming the challenge you get knowledge and practical experience. Because of their different personal lives, professions, and specializations, you'll get a variety of viewpoints and strategies. I think that going forward, gym leaders should lean into this mentorship aspect. Now what kinds of things can we add to gym leaders to enhance this idea? Well, the seeds of this idea already exists in the franchise. First, turn your attention to the Pokémon anime. You'll see that a fair amount of gyms have a battlefield designed with their type specialty in mind. Water gyms have pools with platforms or islands. Gyms for all the earthy typings, rock, ground, and steel, will have large craggy fields with plenty of boulders. The idea is that by fighting against a type specialist with their home field advantage, it's a challenge, but you get practical experience where you'll quickly learn how to make that type of Pokémon shine. The next idea we can pull from the anime is the idea of gym leader level scaling. In the Pokémon Origins miniseries, which I highly recommend, a gym leader will ask how many badges you have. Based on your response, they will select a prepared team appropriate to the number of badges you have. In the example I gave, the challenger had no badges, so Brock selected a two Pokémon team at lower levels. Aside from being more fair, it allowed Brock to focus on teaching basic move mechanics and type effectiveness. The last piece of influence comes from the bosses in another JRPG, Bravely Default. The games in the Bravely Default series has a job system which allows you to change your class. A fair amount of bosses will unlock a class upon their defeat. When you fight them, you'll get to see the strategies they use because they mostly follow the same rules in battle that you do. 
Sometimes they break the rules for balance purposes. Some of them fight in pairs and larger groups, so you'll be able to see multiple jobs working together to create complex setups in battle. You're forced to deal with it and overcome it, and afterwards you can steal and improve their ideas. Translating these ideas to the next Pokemon games could be a fun challenge. First off, we get gym-based level scaling based on the number of badges you have. Scarlet and Violet have been designed in a non-linear way where you can challenge most things at any time. But there is no level scaling, so you can't deviate from the expected path too much at the start. In addition, the game doesn't just have gyms. There's two other stories going on at the same time. And those stories wouldn't have a logical reason to scale, so it's not as necessary to do so. However, if a future game were to follow Scarlet and Violet's somewhat open-world design, we could see the gym leader's level scale and have three to four preset teams for different stages of the game. Obviously, their post-game rematch teams should be full six Pokémon teams with items. Since the AI in Pokémon games isn't too crazy, super intense VGC and Smogan level plays aren't going to be going on all game. But we can expose players to easier combos that the AI is better suited to use. Next, the battle venues. Each gym should have a sort of home field advantage. It shouldn't be something like a pool that only allows water types, or an aerial field that only allows flying types. That's a cool idea, but that should be left to optional things like rematches or specific challenge areas in the game. I'd still like challenges like nuzlocks and solo runs to be possible for the people that enjoy them. Instead, Battlefield should have something like perpetual weather or terrain that can't be overwritten. This will be active no matter how many badges you have. This is just the trait of the gym battle. Gym Guy, the gym guy, will greet the player at the entrance of each gym and explain that the field effects normally expire after a few turns, but specifically in these gyms, they last forever and can't be changed. The gym leader's team should also be built to capitalize on those benefits they get. For example, an Electric-type gym could have Perpetual Electric Terrain active. Their Zero Badge team could just be two low-level Electric types like Shinx and Elekid that can benefit from the Electric Terrain boosted stab and avoid sleep from the low-level Grass types you may bring to resist their Electric moves. Whereas the three or four badges owned team could be a double battle making use of the plus and minus Pokémon. A double battle that stacks Electric Terrain, Stab, and the boost from plus and minus could be really tough to deal with, but it's offset by the fact that Plusel, Minin, and Toxtricity are the only Pokémon that would be able to do this for the Gym Leader since hidden abilities should not be on any trainers or Gym Leaders until very late game or post game. Lastly, around 7 to 8 badges we can get a more robust Electric-type team taking full advantage of the terrain. We can get full Volt Turn spam for single battles to help the AI avoid weaknesses and deal ridiculous damage under terrain. It also has the effect of letting the Gym Leader get some momentum even if the player is playing on Switch Mode. Imagine a pure Electric-type escaping against a Ground-type allowing Kilowattril to come in. Then once the ground type leaves for a rock or ice type, it volt switches out to magneton or magnezone to resist ice and rock moves. Perhaps in late game or post game rematches, we could have an electric gym double battle where the gym leader's primary strategy is to spam and combo discharge with lightning rod, volt absorb, or motor drive. Again, like the past examples, the early game versions of these teams would be lacking coverage, tutor moves, or evolutions to compensate for your weakness. But the late game teams can be more degenerate because you should be strong enough to deal with this nonsense. This should especially be the case for post-game rematches. We can even make it so that the gym leaders pair up for optional double battles where they combine their battlefield bonuses for even more challenge. We could go on all day about the many monotype teams that could be made for each stage of the game. In fact, I could probably make a video for every single type, where I make all the preset teams a gym leader would use for different stages of the game. Because that would take forever, we're skipping that for now. Instead, we will quickly theorize battlefield bonuses for the types, since finalizing those bonuses would need to come before making the teams anyway. 
We'll go through rapid fire in the interest of time and assume that the effects are permanent unless otherwise stated. Since there's a lot of effects, I'll be skipping minor details that aren't really relevant to potential gym leader strategies, or repetitive details like how terrains only affect grounded Pokémon. Lastly, since there isn't already a field effect for every type, we'll have to make our own or adjust existing effects to suit our needs, or at least act as placeholders until we can come up with something better. Let's begin! Bug gyms have a sticky web or a spider web on the ground that can't be gotten rid of and only affects the player. I'm not sure if sticky web's minus one speed drop is too weak, and should be a minus two speed drop. If sticky web is too weak, I'm open to spider web being active to prevent switching, but that could also be too strong. Dark gyms will have dark aura be active, which boosts the power of dark type moves. Alternatively, it could be a gym that's rigged with tricks, or the gym leader's Pokémon could just be complete cheaters. The effects of the moves Taunt, Torment, Embargo, Quash, Snatch, or Knock Off could be activated after certain turn thresholds. Since it would just be an automatic field effect, or gym traps, they wouldn't do damage. There's plenty of options for a battlefield conducive to underhanded battle methods. Dragon Gyms get something new. We're borrowing from the theme of Claire's Gym, and from the concept of the move Draco Meteor to create a gym that rains brimstone. This brimstone deals passive damage to all types except Dragon, and the debris prevents the setting of any terrain. I thought about an effect that removes recoil, charging, and recharging turns, because I wanted to capture the essence of the enraged and rampaging Dragon raising down towns that we see all the time in Pokémon. However, I realized that dragons don't particularly benefit from that as much as other types do. As you remember, electric gyms get perpetual electric terrain, which has the main benefits of preventing sleep and boosting the power of electric moves. Fairy gyms have misty terrain active, mainly negating status and having the power of dragon-type moves. Fire gyms get Perpetual Sun, which boosts the power of fire, weakens water, grants one turn solar beams or solar blades, lowers hurricane and thunder accuracy, and boosts healing from moonlight synthesis and morning sun. Fighting type gyms are another strange one. Perhaps something like the effect of no guard for the entire battle? Reflect, light screen, and aurora veil are automatically brick broken? Maybe the simplest implementation is the best one. The gym has an aura of fighting spirit, instilling a strong will and boosting the power of fighting type moves. Fighting is a pretty straightforward and honest typing that just plows through opponents with skill or power. I suppose that that's fitting enough. Flying gyms can get perpetual tailwind, strong winds, automatic defog every couple of turns, or automatic whirlwind at the end of three to five turns. These effects, whichever individual or combination is ultimately decided, would be in favor of the gym leader. Ghost gyms can cast an automated curse effect on the player every 3-5 to five turns. This would cause the active Pokémon to lose 25% health at the end of their turn while afflicted. You can switch to get rid of it. If that's too strong, it can cast Spite on the opponent every 3-5 to five turns, which makes you lose 4 power points on the last move used. Grass Gyms get Perpetual Grassy Terrain, which boosts the power of grass moves, weakens the power of ground shaking moves, makes Grassy Glide a priority move, and other benefits. Ground Gyms automatically negate terrains from being set and have a never-ending Sandstorm. Even though Sandstorm is Rock-type, this allows ground Pokémon to abuse sand-related abilities. We could potentially have it so that the battle always has at least one layer of spikes active. The gym leader can stack more spikes by having their Pokémon use spikes. However, if the trainer clears the hazards, at least one layer will always remain. An alternative option is a Smackdown machine or a large ceiling fan that automatically grounds flyers and levitators every 3-5 to five turns but I'd prefer players to actually be rewarded for trying to use immunities. Ice gyms get Perpetual Snow, granting a defense boost to all ice types. It also makes Aurora Veil very easy to repeatedly set and allows Blizzard to always hit. 
Normal gyms get a battlefield that normalizes all player moves, which means that all the moves the player uses becomes normal type, but the gym leader can still use coverage. In a sense, you're forced to become the normal type specialist. You have to use strategies other than having four offensive coverage moves, and you are pushed to make use of resistances and proper switching since your weaknesses can still be targeted. Because of the normalized gimmick, they will not have normal ghost types as to not softlock the game. Poison gyms have a noxious gas in the air that poisons all player Pokémon vulnerable to the status effect. I opted to not have it be on removable toxic spikes since flyers and levitators would be able to avoid it, which overlaps too much with ground gyms. Alternatively, there could just be a poisonous corrosive that drops both defenses upon switching in. Psychic gyms get perpetual psychic terrain, which boosts psychic type damage, negates increased priority, and allows expanding force abuse. If that's not enough, they could get something like Reflect or Light Screen automatically set at the start of battle or intermittently. It would need to be spaced out to avoid being too oppressive. Rock gyms get Perpetual Sandstorm, which boosts the defense of all rock types, deals chip damage to all types except for the earthy types, and allows them to abuse Sand Force, Sand Rush, and Sand Veil. Or the rock gyms can also automatically set Stealth Rock. Maybe both, I haven't decided. Steel Gyms get Perpetual Magnet Rise on the side of the Gym Leader, so their Pokémon will not count as grounded. Or we could bring back the Sharp Steel Hazard as a Gym Battle gimmick. For those that don't know, it's a Stealth Rock clone that calculates damage based on the type effectiveness against Steel. For this Gym, doing both the Magnet Rise and the Sharp Steel could also be an option. Water gyms get infinite rain, so fire deals less damage, water deals more damage, solar beams damage is halved, thunder never misses, and hurricane never misses. Wow, that's quite a lot of potential options and their power levels certainly differ, especially at different stages of the game. The normal gym idea is completely easy to defeat in an open world level scaled Pokemon game because you can do it first when everyone only has tackle and poor coverage. However, if it's a linear game with that normal gym in the late game, challenging it could be a struggle. The opponent will have crazy coverage, whereas the player's offensive coverage will be neutral no matter what they do. Overall, if you add these mechanics to gyms in an open world Pokemon game, it's going to take thought to create battlefields and multiple teams that can be a cohesive and relatively fair challenge at every stage of the game, regardless of the order the player approaches gyms. Luckily for me, we usually only have 8 gyms in a Pokemon campaign, so it's not like all 18 need to be perfect right now. This can also just be implemented in a linear game at first as practice, then later refine it to work in an open world game. This is great. We've got the framework for improved gyms during the campaign. During the post game, you should be able to rematch gym leaders when they aren't busy with their other responsibilities. We should continue to see the gym leaders interact with each other in the game, see their friendships, rivalries, and different viewpoints about strategy. They hang out, you come across them in side stories, and they challenge you to a complex double battle where their gimmicks combine. Picture the water and electric gym leaders combining their rain and electric terrain gym effects together to spam electric terrain boosted, perfect accuracy thunders, along with all the other benefits they get. Or the fire and grass gym leaders pairing up their sun and grassy terrain. The grass types get double the benefit from using growth, and using single turn stab solar beams or solar blades. Grass types also get a fire type coverage move with weather ball if they learn it. Fire types get to enjoy taking essentially neutral damage from bulldoze, earthquake, and magnitude. It would be a great way for Pokemon to more organically bridge the gap between single player gameplay and VGC. Similar to how the Battle Frontiers in Generation 3 and 4 were a gateway to competitive singles play for many people. I'm excited thinking about all the ridiculous setups that could come from these pairs challenging you. At this point I've ranted for far too long and should probably end the video. I want to ask you all, what gym tag team do you think is the most broken and why? Tell me in the comments, I really want to read what kind of brutal strategies you come up with. Yes, I am indeed using you as my QA team. 
Any errors or important information will be in the pinned comment, something that I always put before making a video public. That's all I've got, and I'll see you some other time. Goodbye.